start now, okay? Don't ring yet, though. <laughs> Welcome to St. Paul Church. We're glad you're here this morning. And uh, a few announcements that I do want to share with you. I know that you are all here and excited that following this service, we're having a congregational meeting because we want to deal with some of the most exciting things in our congregation that we have dealt with in years. We are, re we are redoing our Constitution, and I can't tell you that there's nothing more exciting than that. So, make sure you, we'll give you a break at the end of the service, then we'll restart for the meeting, and uh, encourage you to be prompt back into your seats. Vote right away as soon as you sit down. I don't care which way you vote, just put your hand up and say yes. And nothing's been presented yet, but just say yes, and then we can finish up. No, I want to encourage you to um, do that. You have to do this quick, because the patriotic concert is tonight at 7 o'clock. Following the meeting, the choirs, um, the combined choir is going to meet uh, for just a, a run-through of tonight's song. Um, so I want to make sure you do that. And then the flowers, the patriotic flowers up by the altar there um, are for tonight. And Ron, where's Ron? He went ahead and put that together. Let me just tell you, when I give flowers to Sue, I say, here, honey. And then they look better after it's in the nice spray, but he did that up so nicely. Then flowers on the piano um, are in memory of Jean Mashaw, and uh, her service was yesterday. So I encourage you to continue to pray for the Mashaw family. And then, um, what else do I have? As you drove in today, uh, as I drove back yesterday uh, afternoon, I got to tell you, excellent job for the church workday. Our campus looks great. Um, unfortunately, I noticed that you didn't climb the trees to pull all the leaves back. Uh, all of them off, so there's going to be still some things that will need to be cleaned up, but the campus looks great, so thank you for all of you who both uh, inside and outdoors. It just looks wonderful, and again, that's what we call in ministering to each other. And then there's a sign-up sheet for college goodie boxes. Uh, encourage that for study time for final exams. Once again, I will encourage you to sign up for a non-family member, so give other people opportunity to bless your grandchildren or your children or nieces and nephews. You go ahead and sign up for somebody else. And then when it comes to your own family member, you still send something to your family member. I want you to do that. But uh, I just want to give other people the opportunity to bless your family. So those are our announcements. And we'll begin our worship service with the ringing of the bell and our prelude. Thank you. 
Would you stand with me for our call to worship? To the regions beyond, I must go where the story has never been told. To the hardest of places he calls me to go, not thinking of comfort or ease. Hymn number 297, I love to tell the story.
2,000 years, Lord, churches just like St. Paul have gathered together because somebody told the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And we praise you, Father, that we can do that today, that we can do that with the power of the Holy Spirit. And we ask, Father, through your Spirit, that your presence would be sensed, Lord, and that we would believe that you are right here with us, enjoying this old, old story. So bless us in our worship, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated in hymn number 300, I'll Tell the World That I'm a Christian. As we're singing that song in that second verse, it's a recognition that if we have a faith in Christ, we're going to heaven. And there's more to life that we will look forward to. We will look forward to eternal life. The message of the song is, I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. And sometimes I think we forget that we live in a world who really doesn't know Christ. There's family and friends and co-workers who don't know Christ. And someday, that world will end for them individually, or Jesus comes back, and we who are believers will go to heaven. That's what it's about for us. This world is just going to be temporary, but heaven's going to be for eternity. And often when I hear a song like this, and I know today's message, I often wonder and think, all right, well, 
who of my friends, my family, or anything like that, if this was, if we knew that tomorrow was their last day, or tomorrow that Jesus was coming back, would I tell them, because I know that for sure. And of course, we don't know that, but in the song, it's like we are called to live our lives like Jesus is coming back any day. And I always go ahead, and as we come to this time of prayer, when I think about this, I think of people who I'd want to pray for, people who I would want to know the Savior. And let me encourage you in our time of prayer this morning to think of one, two, three. Go with three. Three names that you want to lift up, that given the opportunity, and folks, you might have to take the opportunity to make the opportunity, it's not just going to necessarily fall on your laps, but who will you pray for this morning, that God will give you the opportunity to just share the good news of Jesus Christ? Not with saying, look, I want to make sure they don't go to hell, but you want to make sure that they're going to heaven. That's really what it's about. Eternal life with Jesus Christ. So in our time of silent prayer, let me encourage you to pray for those three people this morning. Let's pray together. Father, as we come before you this morning, just for myself, Lord, and I know that I might have these people who I prayed for just earlier. They might be listening in today. But Father, I prayed for three of my family members. Father, who I know don't know you as Savior. And I prayed, Father, that that opportunity might come to be able to share or in any conversation that I might have with them, or a note that I might write them, that I would have a freedom, Lord, but also that they would, your Holy Spirit would be moving in their lives. That, Father, they would seek out you as Savior and Lord. Lord, you just tell us to tell the world that we're Christians. Father, it's not something to be embarrassed about. It's not something we have to worry about. For Father, our faith guarantees us a place in heaven. And Father, that should be rejoicing on each of our hearts no matter what we face on any day at any moment. That Father, we are only here in this world a short period of time. But because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we have eternity to be rejoicing, to be celebrating, to not feel pain or hurt or disappointment. Help us, Father, to be heavenward thinking and share that good news with others. We thank you for that privilege now and pray as you taught your first disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, and Acts 1, 8. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Would you pray with me, please? This fall, Lord, we have been examining the purpose-driven life. And Father, while we come to a conclusion as far as the book that we've been reading before and, and after, Lord, where it still won't be done, Lord, but today we come to this fifth purpose about our mission. And again, my prayer, Father, is, is that your Holy Spirit would reveal through your word truths for us, Lord, not just as knowledge, but as action. And so help us with godly wisdom through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. For the past four weeks, we have looked at God's different purposes for our lives. And as a foundation, when we began this series, we looked at the fact that this life, your life and my life, is really, because of our faith in Christ, a preparation for heaven, a preparation for eternity. And if you have that relationship with Jesus Christ, really these first four purposes are things that we'll be doing in heaven. If you would like, you could say it. maybe this is a little bit of heaven on earth. If you recall, you'll see that our first purpose was worship, and that was to know and love God. That's what God calls us to do in building a relationship with him. To know and love him, and that's what worship is all about. And the second purpose was fellowship, to learn to love each other. I got to admit, as being a pastor now for almost 40 years, um, Christians don't always get along. If you read through the book of Acts, Paul didn't always get along and with, with others. But our fellowship here on earth is we're called to learn to love and know each other, to learn to love each other. So in you loving each other and me loving you, that's what heaven's going to be like. And then some of you are saying, oh, really? Well, I'm having a little trouble with this. Well, it's going to be different in heaven, but we get to practice here on earth. And then the third purpose was discipleship, to become more like Christ. That's what we live our lives for, and it's a process. And then last week, the whole aspect of service, to learn to serve God by serving others. All four of these purposes will be practiced in heaven. You'll be good at it when you get there if you practice well on earth. But this fifth purpose is different. It's the only purpose that you can do here on earth. God's fifth purpose for your life is that you were made for mission. In John 17, verse 18, Jesus is speaking to God. He's praying. Let's listen in to what he says. He says, God, in the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. Folks, if you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a mission in this world that we call home. Last week we talked about serving God by serving others. And that was a focus on ministry. And ministry was in the context of serving other believers in the church. Last week I shared with you some of the needs of serving in our church. While I checked with Christina this morning, we still need more helpers for Awana. Sunday school could use more help. Tech support. Dennis, how am I doing with that back there? Dennis is like raising their hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Pastor. Yes. More tech support in the back. Yes. They do a great job, but they want a little more freedom. They'd like to sit with their family at times like you're enjoying. And I have to tell you, all of those areas, and there's more within this congregation of ways to serve, none of them need a PhD. And they will train you. 
and you'll become good at it. And let me encourage you. Just all they're looking for is a willing heart. And that's all that God wants to use. And there's a difference between service ministry and mission. Serving in the church is for the believer. That's what we're about. We gain this fellowship with each other. This is for the person who is already has a faith in Jesus Christ. But mission, that is to the unbeliever. Mission is to the person who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Each one of us here, and I make no assumptions, but each one of us here who has a relationship with Christ needs to have a ministry to other believers. But each one of us here who has a relationship with Christ also needs to have a mission in the world that which we live. And mission in the world becomes now our fifth purpose, to share the message of Jesus Christ. I have to tell you, once I realized that Jesus, that God was in control, once I know that God made me as he could love, because, so he could love me, once I know that my life isn't an accident, that I'm here for a purpose, that life has a purpose for each of us, once I know these things and understand these things, then God expects me to share that message of hope with other people. That's what he made us for. He didn't want us to just sit back and say, well, enjoy it. No, share it with other people. In Acts 1.8, Sue read that Jesus told his disciples that they are to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Three locations where mission was meant to happen. Now, before we look at the location, let me get in touch with you with the task. You and I are to be a witness. That's the task, to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Jesus did not tell his disciples that I want you to be defense attorneys. Sometimes I think believers think that way. Jesus didn't tell his disciples to be persecutors. You don't have to defend God, and you don't have to accuse unbelievers. God doesn't need your help for that. Jesus didn't tell his disciples and say, go out and be salesmen and women. God wasn't for sale. He just said, be my witness. Well, well what's a witness? A witness is someone who tells what they have seen, what they have experienced. A witness simply tells you what happened to them. You see, you are an expert witness on your own life. Nobody can tell your story better than you can. Nobody can be a better witness of what God has done in your life than you are. You're the best storyteller. You're the authority on your own life. If you would like, you have a PhD on understanding your own life. And some of you are saying, no, there's a lot of it I don't understand. You understand your faith. That's what it's about. God says, I want you to go all over to the people that are close to you. And that would be your Jerusalem. That would be where you witness to those close to you. To the people near, but they're different. And that would be your Judea and Samaria. And then there's simply everybody else. Everybody else that you can tell your own story about Jesus. And that would be the rest of your world. And so where is it that you and I are to be witnesses? Where are we going to go to find people who don't believe in Jesus Christ so that we can be witnesses? This morning I want to share with you three locations in which we are called to be witnesses. And the first location in which we are called to be a witness is our own world, our own Jerusalem. We're going to go local. That's the starting point. Do you know where your world is? In Luke chapter 8, Jesus heals a man. Many miracles like that we read. And the man is so overcome by the healing that he wants to travel with Jesus. I mean, who wouldn't? Look what happened, and he wants to travel with Jesus. 
But Jesus says, no, I don't want you to do that. Instead, Jesus said this, return home and tell how much God has done for you. And then we read that the man went home and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Our first location is our world, our home, our backyard. It starts right in our neighborhood. Mission begins right in your own community. That is God's plan. Start in your own world. He wants you to go to your friends, your family, your co-workers, your neighbors, really anyone who crosses your path. Be a witness. Share the good news. Share how Jesus Christ has affected your life with the people in and around your home. Now, it kind of sounds easy. I mean, you don't have to travel very far. Gas prices are going up, so you, you don't have to worry about doing that. But then, really, it's not very easy for the average Christian. Matter of fact, if there's above average Christians, it's probably not easy for them. You see, I've heard it said, you've heard it said, that at family gatherings, the rule of thumb is you don't talk about politics and you don't talk about religion. That is the rule of thumb for families. I've heard it for years. There's a myth that has been permeated in our society that people aren't really interested in spiritual issues. The more I read, the more you get the feeling for that. But I gotta tell you, I don't believe there's anything further from the truth. I don't think we've changed much in 20 years, but in 20 years ago, somewhere around there, I read a poll by George Gallup. He had discovered, however they do polls, and with just elections over, we always wonder about polls anyway. But I read this one where he said that 65 million Americans don't have a church that they call home. 65 million. What's that, roughly one-fifth of the population of the United States? But then he went on and his poll also said, but 34 million of them, more than 50%, said they would attend church if somebody would just invite them. I've known this fact for 20 years, or this poll. And I gotta believe those numbers have only increased, but people need to be invited. People need to be invited to the place where you are growing in your faith where you come week in and week out, whether the pastor is good or bad. That's the reality of it. You come to worship. You come to fellowship with other believers. You come to pray. That's what ministry is about. That's where you find comfort. That's where you find hope. And literally, there are millions of people who don't have that. Remember, our job is not to sell Jesus. Our job is not to defend Jesus or accuse others about him. Our mission is to be a witness about what he has done in your life, what he has done in my life. We just have to have the mindset to want to share A man by the name of Elsie Hester of White Flowers, Texas, is a plumber. He packs a New Testament with his tools. He is known in that area as the witnessing plumber. And a minister said this of him. That witnessing plumber has won hundreds, of, to, hundreds to Christ since he became a Christian. Many will listen to a working man who will not listen to a preacher. That's true, folks. And I got to tell you, if you think that it's my job as a pastor to be a witness to those in your home or your family, your friends, your co-workers, that's just wrong. That's not what God has called me to do. You are called to be a witness. You are called to be a witness locally to your family, to your friends, to your neighbors. 
You're called to share your story. How you came into this wonderful relationship with Jesus and share it with others. And if they know Christ, embrace their faith. But that's the, our mission to the world, our local world, is just to be a witness. The second location which we're to be a witness is just beyond our world. In our text, this would have been identified as Judea and Samaria. Get out of town, in other words. We start by being a witness to those close to us. But then we need to dare to reach beyond our local world. Maybe another way to put it is we need to reach beyond our comfort zone. Because of Christ's love for me, I need to be a witness to a broader context. I need to reach out to people with different backgrounds. One of the reasons I love being a chaplain at a hospital, one of the reasons why I happen to like going to thrift stores, and Sue will go ahead and she says, I didn't type this in there. And I kid her around about it, but I'm serious about it. It's the opportunity to connect with other people. It's the opportunity to bring the hope of Christ. You don't have to browbeat people. But you've got to look at it and says, yes, I want to be missional. I want to go ahead and share my faith with others. When I was first, we were first married, we were in Connecticut. I coached volleyball. I love volleyball. It's a sport I played in college. But I had a friend ask me if I would play volleyball in a business league. I'd never played in this kind of circumstance, but I realized that my whole reason for playing was not so much that I liked volleyball, but I was now out of the church, out of my local community, with a group of people that I could share my faith with. Now, the only thing I did with my friend was said, just don't tell anybody I'm a pastor. It'll come out eventually. But I could share my faith. There's more to that story if you want to take the time. The mission that we have in life is not a mission about feeling good. The message of our mission has eternal consequences. And if that's the case, we must be willing to go into and be risk takers. Risking our comfort zone to get the message out. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9.22, I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means, I might save some. Paul is saying, I am trying to find common ground with other people so that I can tell them about Jesus Christ and that I'll allow through the Holy Spirit for Christ to save them. Look, if you had a cure for a disease like cancer, would you just keep it to yourself or would you tell others about it? Oh, I think we'd be shouting it from the rooftops, shouting it from the stream. And yes, there will be the, oh, well, yeah, it might work for you, but it's not going to work for me. I mean, we'll get those doubters kind of thing, but it's an information we won't need to keep as a secret, but that's often what we do with our faith. What's the message that we bear witness to? We have eternity in heaven. We know that the cure for our life here on earth and for eternity is found in our relationship with Jesus Christ. In Galatians 6, 2, we read, Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens so complete Christ's law. And what's Christ's law? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what he calls us to do. And you don't have to leave Stevenson, Winnebago, Rock or Green, or whatever county you might live in. You don't have to leave the county to do that. You know that when you read the Bible and you read about Jesus, that Jesus' mission was always rooted in the part of humanity that society often ignored. Jesus did care about the poor, the homeless, the widows, and the orphans. He cared about the sick, the social outcasts, the imprisoned. He cared so much, but he also always claimed his role in the process of who he is as their savior. As a congregation, our missions here, we support Freeport Pregnancy Center, the Salvation Army, Rockford Rescue Mission. Some of you volunteer in those organizations or have, 
And on the 21st, we're going to dedicate over 500 boxes, and I'm not going to tell you how many, for Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child. But some of you are saying, you know what, I need to go beyond that, so you're going to sign up to go to Aurora and go to the processing center because you want to be involved. And I'm sure all of those mission organizations that I mentioned, which kind of fit into our Judea and Samaria aspect, could use more help. They're all focused, all of them, which is why we as a church chose them, on sharing the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, at the core of their mission. Now these represent mission experiences that you and I are pretty common and know about, but I'm sure there's a lot others that we could be involved with. Individually, we can be involved with. I remember having an, uh, someone ask me one time, you know, well, are there more opportunities for mission? Do they need more help? Every local ministry needs more help. But then I think of other areas. How many people are in nursing homes just wanting to have someone hold their hand and chat with them? And I know, I was just in one yesterday, that it's not always easy to get in. And holding hands right now, and it's someone in a nursing home, that's not a good thing to do, and I recognize that. And I was masked up, and that was fine also. I identified myself with the person. But God just wants us to make the first move. Was it convenient yesterday? No, it wasn't convenient. We had stuff that we had planned on our agenda. But it was one of those things I wanted to. I missed seeing the person the other day. I hadn't seen them before. And they're new, and you don't need to know anything else about that. But it's an opportunity. There's other areas of ministry. There's other ways of serving in Judea and Samaria. Interesting, as I was writing this, I was like, okay, over and over again, I get the sense that God just wants us to go. I want you to go. Go into all the world. And then I got thinking about it, and this is the way my brain works, since it scares some of you. And I realized you can't spell God without go. I know you're sitting there like, well, of course, I, I, I know that one. You can't spell good news without go. You can't spell gospel without go. But I think too often we act like our go has gotten up and gone. And our go is in our gone, and that becomes tiresome. In Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, Jesus says, Let me assure you that no one has ever given up anything for love of me and to tell others the good news. You won't be given back. Who won't be given back a hundred times over? That's the mission. But then it goes on to say basically that if you tell others this good news, blessings will be returned to you a hundred times over. Now I have to admit, I'm not a, a math person. I don't know what a hundred times over means. I read somebody who tried to put it on an estimate, and Fritz might use your help afterwards. You can go ahead and, as a banker, tell me is. But somebody wrote that it was 10,000% interest. That's what a hundred times over is. I'm thinking, I'm looking at CDs, and I'm like, okay, I'm lucky if I get a half a percent interest. Look, try to find rates of 100 times over in the world, and I realize it's not a monetary thing. But do we have the will to look around our community and see that the call to be involved in mission is close, and that the blessing of being involved in mission is incredible? Where is your Judea and Samaria? And who is it that you will share the good news of Jesus Christ with? But there's more. It's not just to be a witness to those in our own world or to reach just beyond our world. It's with Jesus. We're called to care for the whole world. The whole world. We start in Jerusalem where we live and then we move to our surrounding community, Judea, Samaria, but we're called to go to the ends of the earth to witness. I want to be a witness to my world. John Wesley put it this way, I look on the world as my parish. In other words, the world was his church. The world was where he would share 
I dare to reach beyond my own world, and then I care about the whole world. We support missions in this church locally, nationally, and internationally. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus is speaking to his followers. Go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. Well, who's Jesus talking to? Well, it wasn't the pastors. It wasn't the missionaries. He's just talking to his followers, his disciples, which we claim to be as we pray the Lord's Prayer. And you know what? If you're a Christian today, then Jesus is talking to you. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. And if you're not fishing, you're not really following. He tells us to go everywhere because everybody deserves to hear the message of Jesus. Now, I remember when I was a kid, high school, middle school, more of that age, we would have missionaries regularly come to our church service and they would share their stories. And up until my sophomore year of high school, I couldn't imagine going to a foreign country. I couldn't imagine going to the jungles of Borneo, although I saw slides of it and it looked gorgeous. Then I saw pictures of the mountains of Chile, and I thought, that looks nice, but I can't imagine. And then I always thought of Africa as deserts. I didn't know, and I couldn't imagine going there. As many of you know, I spent two years in Kenya, East Africa, as a missionary. But i got to tell you, today, even now, 40 years later, it's easy to go into all the world. I have friends who were missionaries, are still missionaries, in Asia, and Central, and South America, and Europe, and, of course, Africa. And i got to tell you, transportation has changed a lot. Today, think about it. When Jesus told the disciples what they have, donkeys, yeah, and they still went. We're a little bit upgraded. We have planes, trains, buses, automobiles. We've got ships. But let me take it a step further. We've got something called the Internet now. We have instant gratification, really, to the world. You all have your phone with you. How many of you have your phone with you? Uh, Sue's got my phone. I'm on call, so it's like, okay, you better make sure you hold that. We have all of these opportunities. We have a platform. You can still be in your pajamas, and you can witness to somebody in a foreign country. I don't recommend the pajama part, but I recommend the mission. Mission is about sharing the love of Jesus Christ with others. It's taking the message to our family. It's to our friends. It's our coworkers. It's taking the message of Christ to our community and, the, and then to the ends of the earth. So last night as I was prepping, I asked her, I said, how many friends do you have on Facebook? 322 friends she has. I have four. I'm not on Facebook, but I have like four friends. She has 322, so I bask in the friends that she has. And so Sue every Sunday posts our worship service on her Facebook page. But she also fo- f- goes ahead and posts the service on her, what do they call it? Your Story page. I know nothing about this. But Your Story is on there for 24 hours, and she probably has 30 to 50 people each week acknowledging that she did this. Now, I know from the numbers that we see on Facebook and our church website, we don't have as many people as we'd love to have there, but it's a simple way of putting God's Word out into our community. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment as we kind of finish up here. You ever wonder why God doesn't just take to heaven all those who come into a relationship with him? I've thought about this before. Lord, I believe you are my Savior. Take me home to heaven. You're sitting there like, well, it doesn't work that way. No, I know it doesn't work. You see, there are only two reasons today why you can't just go to heaven. You know, God's timing, but I mean two reasons why you can't do what you, two things you can't do in heaven also. There's two things. You never thought about that. That's why I'm here this morning to help you that. Two things you can't do in heaven. First is you can't sin in heaven. The second is you can't be a witness in heaven. Now, 
Which of those two reasons do you think God has left you on earth here for? And I'm going to just give you a hint. He didn't leave you on earth here so you could sin. Which means that he left you on earth here to be a witness. The only reason why your heart is still beating this morning is that when we became, come, became a, a Christian, when we became, it came into a relationship with Jesus Christ, God wanted you to share that with other people. If somebody hadn't been a witness to me, in my case, my parents, my sister, if they hadn't been a witness to me, I could still be lost. The same is true of you. God wants us to pass it on. 2 Peter 3, 9. God does not want anyone to be lost, but he wants all people to change their hearts and lives. And that only happens when you and I get involved in mission one person at a time. We are called to be the light of the world. Are you ready to bring the light of Jesus Christ into the world of darkness? Do you know how much God cares about the unsaved friends and family, your unsaved neighbors and unsaved co-workers who are in spiritual darkness? Do you know how much God loves those in homeless shelters? Do you know how much God loves the Pokot tribe in Kenya? Enough to send his son into the world. That's how much he loves them. That's how much he loves you. To bring light into the world through his son, on the cross. That's how much God loves us. Jesus tells us, this is how much I love you. I'm willing to die for you. This is how much I love the people that you work with. He was willing to die for your co-workers. This is how much I love your relatives, your friends. Jesus was willing to die for them. This is how much I love your next door neighbor. Jesus was willing to die for them. Take the light of Christ into the world. That's what he calls us to do. It's your purpose. It's my purpose in life. Our call to worship this morning included the lyrics of a hymn that I grew up with, and I was not copying it. I wasn't going to teach you the hymn. But called The Regions Beyond. To the regions beyond I must go. I grew up in a church where the need of missions and missionaries was always in the forefront. It was in that church that I gave my life to service thinking cross-cultural missions and ending up in the pulpit for now 37, 38 years. The third verse of this hymn always hit home for me. It says, O ye that are spending your leisure and power in pleasures so foolish and fond, awake from your selfishness, folly and sin, and go to the regions beyond. We still live in a day and time frame where missionaries are still needed throughout the world. Right here locally, in our communities, and throughout the world. Would you pray with me, please? Each of us, Lord, to the regions beyond, we must go and tell of the good news of Jesus Christ. What a privilege, Lord. Thank you for that, in Christ's name, amen. One of the great things about going to the regions beyond is that where Christ has gone before and where he goes, others have gone. There's still unreached peoples. There's still place for people to go as missionaries. But missionaries have brought Jesus Christ into the world. And wherever you go, where Jesus is proclaimed, these same things are shared. They share his body, and they share his blood. They share that Jesus was broken for them, and his body was broken, and his blood was shed for the sins of the world. And so at St. Paul Church, we take that, I've been doing this for years and invite you to share in that. So I'll ask the council's members to come up. They will go ahead and serve you in the pews. We'll just ask that you wait and then we'll share in it together. All are welcome. If you know Christ and are seeking Christ, feel free to participate today.
And Jesus took the bread, it was the upper room, right before his death. And he gave it meaning, new meaning. He took the bread and he broke it. He took it and gave it to the disciples and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's share in it together. In the same manner, he took the cup and called it the cup of the new covenant. It was for the cleansing of their sin. It would no longer be the Lamb of God that took away the sin. It would be God's Son who was called the Lamb of God. So let's take it and share it together. It says in Scripture that following that service, they, t- they sang a hymn together. I'm going to have you sing number 299, It's called Rescue the Perishing, and we're going to sing the first and the last verses, verses 1 and 4. We'll stand together as we sing 299. Lord, that's what you call us to do, to rescue the perishing. Lord, you just tell us to be witnesses, witnesses of the grace that's already a part of our lives. Bless us, Father, as we leave this place, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Folks, we'll give you a break, and then come back, and we'll start our meeting.